Amen. So, how is everybody today? Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful day. I'll be excited. Um, so, do we have any um, any tracks? Did anybody take on the task? Take on the task of writing a track? No, no one. Okay, well, good. Um, turn to uh, page in your book. Oh, and by the way, happy Father's Day uh, to all the fathers and grandfathers in the house. Turn to page 177. And if I could get someone to read for us. Section C, number two. In the present, we are being saved from the power of sin. The Bible also uses the word salvation to describe a process which begins the moment we receive Christ as Savior and ends when Christ returns or we meet him in death. As Christians, we must continuously yield our lives to Christ so that sin will not reign in our mortal bodies. This important concept will help us understand verses that are taking and confusing. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1.19. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians 2.12. By which you also you are saved, but you keep in memory what I preach unto you, 1 Corinthians 15.2. And then on the next page as well, there's a couple of scriptures, 178. And that, and that from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Being confident of this very thing, which he has begun a good work in you, will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 6. Amen. Good. So we're focusing on overcoming the power of sin. As it says, we are in the present. We are being saved from the power of sin. All right. Turn to Romans. And in this next section, we're looking at uh, Romans 6, 7, and 8. And for today, we're focused on Romans chapter 6, but we have to begin in chapter 5, and we want to look at... Um, particularly verses 20 and 21, but if someone could read chapter 5, 18 through 21 for us, please. Um, therefore, by the offense, death reigned by one. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. Jesus Christ. That was, yeah, we need 18. 17, 17, I'm, okay, okay. Right. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Mm hmm. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where, but where sin abound, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath Reign unto death, 
even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, great. Thank you for that reading. So what is the what is Paul uh, suggesting here in in these verses? Okay, that we're born in sin. Good. Brother Leon? One man made us sinners, and one man made righteous. Okay, good, good. All right, so we're born in sin. One man made us sinners, and one man. Made us righteous. Good. But not the same man. Okay. But not the same man. So one different man. All right. Not the same man. All right. And when he talks about the the law coming in, what was the purpose in in the context here? What is Paul saying? The law was used for offense. For the law that the offense might abound. Okay, so it says that the law entered that that the offense might abound. Might abound. Okay, so that's the King James, right? Okay, so the law entered. What what do we remember? What we said about the law entering. What did we indicate that that meant? The law entered. God's righteousness. No. Our sin. No. The law came into being, okay? And who brought the law into being? Okay, Moses through God, okay? So the law came in by Moses from God through Moses. So the law entered in or the law came in that the offense, what offense? Huh? Okay, sin. What sin? Okay. This word here is a, what is that word? The is a what? A definite article, meaning it's pointing to one specific thing. And so in this case, it's pointing to the sin all right, which became sin to all of us, all right, so that the sin might abound. Why would God want the sin to abound? Okay, so that he would be able to institute grace, okay? So they would see their need for grace, okay? And also for the fact, Sister um, Angie. Okay, uh, that's true too. What was he accomplishing in addition to these acts by bringing the law in to make the make the offense abound? Okay. That's uh, that's true. Correct, correct. Deacon Tab. Yeah.
Okay, that's good, that's good. So before we had the law, did we know that we were sinners? Be careful now, think about it. Before the law, and let's go back to Moses' day, before the law, did they realize that they were sinners? No. Huh? Okay. Carolyn? Right. Okay. So, so all what you got to always go back to the garden. Okay. When you think about the issue of sin, you always have to go back to the garden. So in the garden, Adam and Eve knew what? They knew they had sinned, but they also knew the righteousness of God. Okay. So. You had the answer here when it says the offense. You took that back to Adam. So when the law comes in, it's coming in to show us the magnitude of the sin. Sister Mary. Absolutely. Right. But they knew they had sin. They knew it, absolutely. I mean, the novice to go and do that and cover themselves. Right. Okay. So the law came in to, to demonstrate how significant sin is. All right. If, if you don't know that stealing is wrong, then you will steal all day long. It's just something to do, right? Brother Reese. I, I think that they just they didn't understand the consequences of sin. And that um, the scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death. I, I, I think that if he, um, he, if he understood from the beginning the consequences of it, that in terms of that there's a penalty. So when Eve took the fruit to Adam and Adam consumed it, was he aware of the consequences? He wasn't? Okay. In that that moment, in fact, when he didn't die, you know, he might be the judgment of, oh, okay, you know, I didn't. He didn't take on that whole concept of what was going to happen. And it was like a rippling effect. It was like. Okay, and that's true. However, did God tell him what was going to be the result of his sin? God said, you shall surely die. All right. Now, did in, in that moment, to Carolyn and Reese's point, did Adam understand the future multiple consequences of this sin for generations and generations?
now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Minimize what they do. There's no consequences mm -hmm. what they do. Okay. And then they continue on in their sin about. Okay, okay, good. Reese? Mm -hmm. But I don't think he knew, the, the, like I said, the, the consequences of his actions because the first thing he did was blame on the priest. I, I mean, it, it was his responsibility. Right. You understand? Right. And he, he, he was blamed on me like he didn't know that. Amen. That's right. It was his responsibility. Yeah. Leon? Yeah. If Adam had not eaten the fruit, would such things as steal be sin? Okay. So, if the way to the way to think about, go ahead. Okay. Well, did sin enter in because? The forbidden fruit was eaten. What 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 is the act of sin? Disobedience. Not being it's rebellion against God. So hold on one second. So the way to answer that question is to com always compare sin to the righteousness of God. Okay. And, and that's what Paul, Reese. It, it was, you know, Adam had access, and he had access to everything in the garden. Right. Except one thing that God told him not to. Right. So it really wasn't about the, the, uh, the fruit on the tree or the potato on the ground. It's the decisions that we make. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a heart thing. Yeah. The uh, stealing wouldn't even exist. Yeah. He could have anything he wants. Right. So I think Paul wants us to get this picture in our minds that we're not talking about comparing what we do to some what somebody else does. It's about what we do in comparison to God. And so God brought in this law to demonstrate the magnitude of the problem. That he was going to solve with what? Mercy. With mercy and grace. Amen. Good. Right. Can I read, can I read something here? Sure. Just to make a point. Yeah. In, in Genesis 2 16. Okay. And it, it says that. And the Lord God commanded the man, right, saying, of every tree of the garden thou may freely eat. Mm -hmm. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in that day thou shalt surely die. Amen. Great. Said he commanded the man, so he, he knew. The man was responsible. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, well, look at the definition. What is the definition of grace? Something that we don't deserve, favor. Okay, something that we don't deserve. He gave us something, right? And then mercy is what? Withholding something that we do deserve. So, is chastisement in here? Withheld. This is withheld.
definition of chastisement is to um, discipline, to um, correct, to punish, to huh? All right, somebody have a smartphone? Look up the definition of chastisement. Okay, Steve. Somewhere in the Bible, it doesn't it say that, well, I can't quote it, but it, yeah, remember it's saying the chastisement of us was upon the Lord. Is that in Isaiah? So, you got it, Steve? What does it say? Severe criticism and refusal of strong reprimand. Severe. Okay, wait a minute. Say it, no, say it again. Severe criticism, a rebuke or strong reprimand, corporal punishment, a beating. The act of scolding or punishing. Okay, so chastisement. Okay, so I guess the point that we're trying to make here is that wrapped up in grace and mercy is the fact that we did not get anything that we were supposed to get. And instead of getting what we were supposed to get, we got something that we didn't deserve. OK, which means that we should have been chastised, rebuked, punished. The wages of sin should have been death. But we didn't get any of that within who took all of that on our part. Jesus Christ. Well, based on the definitions that were just read, it's in the same category. Okay? And, huh? Well, look it up. I mean, it. Okay. I'd just like to mention that. Yeah, the Ron. Well, chest top was in 53.5. It, read that for us. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Amen. And with his stripes, we are healed. Amen. So Christ took it all. We don't bear any of it. Jackie? In that context, Jeremiah, read that again for us, please. Jer where are you, Jeremiah what? Okay, Jer turn to Jeremiah 31, 18. Okay, go ahead and read that for us, Jackie. Okay, so where would Jeremiah be indicating bring me back from? Jeremiah is the prophet, and he's uh, preaching to Israel. And, and so where would he be talking about being brought back from?
Okay. Go ahead, read it, Steve. Okay. But but ans but the question think about the question of being returned back from Reese. From a sinful state. Okay, and what sinful state was Israel in that they would be brought back from? Idol worship. worship which sent them into captivity. captivity. Okay? So God chastised them by sending them into captivity because they had rebelled against him. And so Jeremiah is saying, you have chastised me. Now redeem me and bring me back. He could, but chastisement is, is, I don't see chastisement wrapped up in grace and mercy. Because if he put that upon Christ, then it's not upon us. You see what I'm saying, Reese? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Right. Now, Jackie, are you saying that because they were chastised, that that is a form of correction? I'm not. Ah, OK. 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 No, no, no. I'm sorry. Yep, I hear you. I'm got gotcha you now. A absolutely. Correct. Well, in the context of the penalty for sin, which is what we're talking about, we weren't. We did not suffer the penalty of sin. We won't. And, and that's the mercy that was provided. Okay? So what Paul is wanting us to understand is the magnitude of sin as co contrasted with the magnitude of grace. And, and what does he further go on to say in verse 21? Romans 5, 21. Actually, why don't we read 20 and 21 so we get the proper context. Okay, so what did Paul do with the word sin? Correct, sin has reigned unto death. And so what, what happened to that word sin when you put reigned with it? Roberta. Same was, king. Same was king. Correct. This word here, reign, is, is the Greek word that means king or of a kingdom. Okay? And, and it's, I think it's basilius. That's close to the spelling. That's what that word means in the Greek. It means to be king or of a kingdom. And so when you say that sin is king, you have now made sin a person. 
or personify the word. Okay, which means that Paul is talking about the sin nature. So when we talk about the power of sin, where does the power, where does sin get its power? Roberti? Okay, it is within us. That's correct. Okay, Sister Margaret. Okay, those are those are actions. Those are actions. Uh, seeing, doing, thinking. But what is Paul, Angie? Okay, that's true. And Paul is saying of sin nature is what? If you have a king, remember now, this is sin is the king. What is, if you are in um, pattern? Adam. Okay, good, good, good. If you're in Adam and you are you have the sin nature and sin is king. What is happening? It's ruling you. Absolutely. Ruling. Ruling. When you think of a kingdom, you think of a uh, dominion. Which leads to what? What's a what comes out of the word dominion? Domination. Okay. That, Reese? I thought the question was where it is. No, I was saying the power. Where does the power come from? The power comes from the sheer nature of what sin is. It rules. It has dominion over you. It, it dominates you. Because of its sheer nature. All right. Now, we need to make sure that we're of who um, Paul is talking to. Who is Paul talking to here in Romans? Who is Paul talking to? Who is his audience? Huh? Believers. Right. And we get that out of chapter one. Where Go back to chapter one real quick. Read one through uh, uh, where does it say it? Seven. In seven. Okay, he gets all. He goes all the way down to seven. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So he's talking to saints. All right. So do saints have this condition? Wait a minute, let me ask that again. Do do saints have this condition? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Somebody read Reese. Amen. Amen. OK, so Angie, <laughs> but OK, good, good. All right. So let's see what Paul says about that question. All right. So now transition into chapter six and someone read um, one. And I want to read one through eleven. 
so that we get the full context of what Paul is saying, okay? So someone read chapter 6, 1 through 11, and if you have a pencil, um, circle each time somebody says die, death, dead, or anything that has to do with die or death. Just circle that and see how many times Paul mentions it. So who's going to read it for us? Amen. Amen. Thank you for that reading. So how many times is death or dying? Huh? Thirteen. I had 14, depending on the version. You 14. Amen. So what is Paul talking about? Is he talking about death or is he talking about life? Both. Absolutely. So. Um. The power of sin comes from the dominion that is brought about by the nature of what it is. Okay, it it is absolute rebellion against God. So the power comes from the fact that kings reign. Right. Look at what's happening in um, Syria. Anybody follow what's happening in Syria? That that king is not going to be dethroned. He wants to be in power forever. And that's the way sin is. Sin wants to be in power forever. Okay, so now we're going to find out what Paul says enables the Christian to overcome the power of sin. So in, in verse one, it says what? Shall we continue in sin? And Paul says what? God forbid. May it never be. All right. And then in verse two, what does he say? I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Certainly not. And what else does it say in verse two? How shall we who are dead live in live in sin? All right. Then what does it say in verse three? Read verse three for us. Knowing, knowing yet not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Okay. So baptized in Christ. We were also baptized into his into his death. So when did he die? When did Christ die? Uh, 
Okay, 2,000 years ago on the cross, okay? But when were we, bo- most of us were born in this century, except for maybe one or two of y'all. <laughs> Okay, so 2,000 years later, here we are. We're, we're, you know, we're alive, but Paul is saying that we were baptized into Christ's death. So how did that happen? So God wants us to have a picture. What, what does the word baptize mean? When you think of baptism, you think of that baptismal pool and somebody's going down in the water and then they come up. Okay. All right. That's all right. Good. Good. Cleansing. Good. Submerge. Okay. Those are all good words. And Carolyn. Yes. Good, good, excellent. So the picture that God wants you to have is of this word baptism, or bap, the word is actually baptizo, all right, which means to dip. So in the Old Testament, yes, ma'am, Sister Mary. Amen. Amen. Good. Excellent. Very good. Very good. So in the old te- but Bill. Amen. Good. Which we see in Romans. So if you if you hearken back to to the Old Testament, when the priest would dip his finger in the blood, all right, that that's baptizo. So this is this is dye. And they don't do this anymore today, but people used to dye garments. Anybody ever dye anything? Okay. So let's say you have a white piece of cloth. Okay, that white piece of cloth is in its current environment, right? You're now going to take that white piece of cloth and dip it into a totally new environment and change the nature of that cloth. So that's what the word baptizo here means. When when God baptized us, he placed us, dipped us in Christ. So he took us from what environment? The nature of sin. He took us from this sin nature where sin had dominion, all right, we're in the, the, the dominion of that king. So he took us from that dominion and placed us in the dominion of Christ, all right? And so once in Christ, everything that Christ experienced, we experienced as well. Now, read, read chap, uh, chapter 6. Verse 2, 3, and 4, and 5, and 6. <laughs> See, and why, why do I keep going on like that? Because you need the context. And Paul just keeps going with his thoughts. So someone read 2 through uh, 6. We'll stop there. I think we'll get the gist of it.
and read seven. Read seven. Amen, amen, amen. So the complete thought here is that God, knowing that we were in the dominion of sin, took us out, placed us in Christ. And death, what's the meaning of death? Separate. So God performed an operation of separating us from the old nature and putting us in Christ, which gave us a new nature. This separation is permanent in God's mind. Now, it didn't say that he took out the old nature. The old nature, the old sin nature is still there. And so what happens so I had my gallbladder taken out years and years and years ago. That thing is gone forever. I don't even know where it is right now. It's, it's just gone. OK. But what if they had left my gallbladder in, but cut it wherever it was connected? It was I would still have it. Right. But it just would not be functioning. But if I could sort of go back in there and reconnect it, the gallbladder would be functioning again. So what Christ, what God did is he separated us from the old nature, left it in. How then are we able to sin? We have to reconnect. We are the ones that are making a decision about sin because we reconnect to the old king. So it isn't God. God's fault that we sin. It's a personal decision. Every time we sin, it is a personal decision to reconnect to the old king. That's what Paul is saying in verses one through Actually, 11. Read um, 8 through 11 for us, Steve. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. Wait a minute, say that again. Death no longer is master over him. Amen. Okay, verse 11 is very important. What is verse 11 saying? Consider. Carolyn. Okay, all right. That word consider, and some of you might have in the King James, reckon. Okay. So in the country, they used to say, I reckon that to be true. (laughs) Right. So what <laughs> when they say reckon, that means count it is done in our own minds. It's done. All right. There's no question about it. And if you do that, Paul is saying, if you consider it as done, then it is done. Then don't go back. But that's what happens is we go back. We keep plugging back up to the old nature. Um, so, is it possible, given this operation of separation and baptizo, this dipping into Christ? In fact, before I ask that question, is it possible to take a piece of white cloth, dip it into red dye? Take it out and get it to be white again. Now she bleached. 
Okay. So, is it possible for a Christian to live a sinless life based on what God has done? Meaning, <laughs> no. Uh, is it possible? Is it possible for a Christian to sin no more? No. Is it possible for a Christian to sin no more based on just just the technical aspects of what God has done? He cut the cord. He dipped us in Christ. We are no longer. Audrey. Amen. Okay, excellent. Good. Pastor Bill. I would contend that even if you make that conscious decision, you already have a thought coming to your mind. That is sin. Oh. That will cause you. Now, you may make the conscious decision. Pastor Brown used to say, the, you, the birds may fly out of your head, but you don't have to make a mess. Right. <laughs> right. Some thoughts, some thoughts are sin. Yeah, yeah. Angie? Okay. Okay, good, good. That's that's good. Uh Leon? Uh, I would just like to go to uh first John uh chapter I mean uh verse eight All right, first John one eight. Okay. Right. Okay. I I I, I agree. Carolyn? I'm thinking if we did not sin at all, then why would we, we be well, we to forgive us? Okay, well, how did we get to that point, though? I'm, I'm saying we, are, we get to the point of this capability because of Christ. I'm not taking Christ out. After Christ has saved us, and, and just keep in mind, all of this is happening in salvation. This is the act of salvation. So we are saved. God's grace and mercy. Okay. His grace. Are, is it possible to sin no more? John. <laughs> that, uh, that, that's a, a good. No, it's not something that you buy at the pawn shop. No, it might be something that sends you to the pawn shop, but it's not something that you buy there. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so I want us to contemplate that because look at verse 11. Look at verse 11 of Romans 6. And what does it say? Read that again. Read it out loud. What what is inherent in that statement that Paul makes? What do you see in that statement? Steve, verse 11. I think it's like you were bringing, you were pointing out the word consider. Uh-huh. Because of our academic nature, we all do sin, but we can consider ourselves to be sinless. 
Okay, and, and so that's warm on the track. In that consideration, what is inherent in that consideration? That it can be done. That it can be done, and that it, that you have a, a conscious decision. You have a choice. Okay, you have, it's a choice. Just because the sin nature is there doesn't mean that we have to keep plugging into it. We have a choice. God gives us a choice. God could have taken the sin nature out just as easily as he um, separated us from it. He said, you know what, I, I'm going to make this easy for the, the Christians and I'm just going to take the sin nature out and they're going to live like I planned for them to live. Now, he could have done that in the Garden of Eden. He could have said, why am I going to put, you know what, let's just not even go there. But what does God, what would, what does God want? He wants us to do it on our own free will and in our own free will, we do what? We demonstrate our love for him. We choose God. Yes, that's what he wants. He wants us to choose him. Because what does it say in verse 11? Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So next week, we're going to look at uh, 12 through 23, um, where it, it, Carolyn? No, I just want to say, we're saying how we're talking about being baptized in Christ. Yes. Just for the purpose of being baptized in Christ. Yes. Because we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes. 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 In him, we've been dipped, placed in Christ Jesus. Next week, we're going to look at this issue of who is your master. Okay? All right. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, your blessed hope that you have given us in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of salvation. We thank you, God, for separating us, uh, placing us in Jesus Christ and separating us from the old nature, the sin nature that would uh, dominate us and place us in Christ Jesus, our, our Lord. Father, we thank you for your kindness, for the grace and mercy that you have bestowed upon us. We pray, Lord God, that you will be pleased in our worship throughout the balance of this day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask it all. Walk with the King today. Walk in Christ today and be a blessing.